So you knew the only fortunate thing about community acquired mercy is we have options that are not particularly expensive. Unfortunately, once you get one infection because you're colonizing your nose, you're set up for recurrences. So 30 to 45% of people are going to have a recurrence at a new site. Yes? Yeah, that's a little bit, um, I would not use erythromycin at all for these. Uh, what happens is they have, uh, if they're resistant to erythromycin, which is increasing, uh, they can actually reduce resistance to clindamycin. I would say probably half or more now erythromycin resistant, so I wouldn't even go there. The other problem with erythromycin is it binds to a receptor in your stomach called modulin and causes acute contraction in the stomach and nausea and vomiting and abdominal pain. And the younger you are, the more mobile receptors you have, the worse that side effects. So erythromycin is just a difficult drug to use, and it's four times a day. I would avoid it for three quarters. So back to our recurrences. Interesting, whether we have an antibiotic that works or not, it doesn't interfere, with, it doesn't make any difference with recurrences. It's still about the same. About one in three people is going to come back to the site. That is probably because you're still colonized, and then the next time you get an abrasion, you accidentally inoculated, and then you've got a recurrence. So this was uh, from the Virginia pilot after that case in uh, Bedford. So in October 2007, there was a senior student who died of uh, community-acquired MRSA at Stan River High School in Bedford County. About uh, several hundred students actually then protested that they didn't even want to go back to the school. There was this huge panic. They refused to go to the school. Parents started coming and refusing to let the students go back to school until they demanded that the schools be cleaned. So to deal with this, the school system hired Servpro, didn't bid for a contract, and spent $216,000, closed all their schools, and did environmental cleaning, which was absolutely worthless. So they wasted a quarter million dollars in a panic situation. And this verse has been around forever. This was just 2007. So unfortunately, what they needed in Bedford was education. Uh, but once you let a panic get going, it's kind of hard to stop that train in its tracks. And so they uh, wasted a lot of money. I'm not even sure if they figured out how to pay that quarter they took it right out of the school budget. So when you think about uh, MRSA transmission from person to person in the environment, work environment, or at home, or it's crowding, contact, frequent skin to skin contact, if you have any compromise of your skin, abrasions, cuts, contaminations of items and surfaces, say you have a boil on your back and you're in the gym and you're using the weightlifting bench, guess what's going to be on that weightlifting bench? You're going to contaminate it with MRSA and clones, or you should say the lack thereof. So MRSA is spread through poor hygiene practices like poor hand washing, uncontrolled wound drainage, and contact with surfaces that are contaminated by that drainage. So in general, if you want to prevent spread of MRSA, you just use standard precautions for any body secretions. Obviously, you wear gloves, you're not going to touch them. Wash your hands routinely with soap and water. We'll talk a little bit later, but the alcohol-based hand sanitizers are far better than soap and water. And I would strongly uh, consider uh, anybody that had a MRSA infection having them get Purell or providing them one of the alcohol-based sanitizers because they're markedly superior for MRSA and all other bacteria. Keep any wounds, abrasions, or cuts covered with a clean, dry bandage until that is healed. Avoid sharing any personal items like uniforms, personal protective equipment, clothing, towels, washcloths, cloths, or razors because you can just spread that around. And ensure that contaminated equipment and surfaces are clean with detergent-based cleaners between uses. Now, as far as the individual is concerned, they should wash any contaminated clothing separate from other laundry in hot water with a laundry detergent. Dry their clothes in a hot dryer. Don't air dry it because that's not going to help you kill them at all. Make sure the clothes are dried completely because bacteria like any moisture to help them multiply. And then clean contaminated surfaces with detergent-based cleaners or EPA-registered disinfectants. And this website will give you all of the EPA-certified uh, disinfectants and cleaners that you can use for environmental uh, cleaning. And I don't mean you go around cleaning the environment. What I mean is there's obvious contamination. A MRSA patient who's got infection pain, that's what you clean, not run willy-nilly around the environment. 
As far as employers and MRSA prevention, uh, you really need to place importance on worker safety and health protection uh, in the workplace, ensure availability of adequate facility supplies that encourage uh, good hygiene in the work environment, ensure routine housekeeping in the workplace to create a clean sanitary environment, and ensure contaminated equipment and surfaces are clean with detergent-based cleaners or EPA-registered disinfectants. Uh, for MRSA-infected people, what you want to do is make sure that they keep the wounds that are draining or have any pus covered with a clean, dry bandage. Uh, when those bandages are used and they change them, they can put them in the regular trash. There's no special requirement for disposing of them. I personally probably prefer to put it in a Ziploc bag and put it in, but the guidance from CDC is you can just pitch them in the regular trash. Uh, they should be washing their hands frequently with soap and warm water, especially after changing the bandage or touching any infected wound or coming in contact with infected surfaces. Now, what about MRSA reporting? This is straight from VDH, from the Office of Epidemiology. This is their recent, most recent update. Individuals infected with MRSA should not, not report this to the supervisors unless the condition interferes with their job duties or the wound drainage cannot be contained with the bandage. Those are the two criteria for reporting. So the VDH says, you don't need to report it. It is not necessary to inform other personnel and of an employee with a MRSA infection, but if you have an outbreak in the workplace, that's a different story. Then you want to call your local health department to help you with intervention, education, and advice. Yes? What's the definition of outbreak? Is it going to be more than two people? Or? Yeah, it's, it's really not well defined. But if you had three cases or more that were linked epidemiologically in the workplace, I think that's when I would ask for some help. But I guess if the individual is not per se required to report it to the supervisor, how would the employer know that it was an outbreak? Well, the question is, if you're not required to report it, how would you know? Well, the answer is you might have to just hear about it or you know, keep your eyes open because your VDA says they don't need to report it. So you're right, you may have an outbreak kind of rule along and you have no idea because the requirements aren't that you're reported. I don't know if you remember when the governor, the governor uh, Tim Kaine, said, well, do I want, uh, you're going to have to report all MRSA. Well, holy cow, 80% of all the infections in every emergency room in the state of Virginia, every skin infection, is, he was inundated. And all of a sudden, the next day it came out, oh, we really only want bloodstream infections and severe ones. We don't want to know about it because there's just too many of them. They're everywhere. So unless this is unless directed by a physician, individuals with MRSA infections do not need to be excluded from work as long as wound drainage can be contained with a bandage. Exclusion could be considered for those with wound drainage that cannot be covered and contained with a dry, clean bandage, or those who cannot maintain good personal hygiene. So basically, if somebody comes in with a MRSA infection, They've got it covered. They're covered. They should not be excluded from work according to the VDH. Now, what about uh, getting rid of this MRSA from your nose where it's living? There is an antibiotic ointment called Mupiracin. The, uh, trade, name, the trade name is Bactroban. You put it on a little Q-tip swab and you put it right in the kind of anterior areas just like a centimeter inside the nose on both sides, use it twice a day, usually for five days. And that can reduce colonization by 90 to 95 percent. Uh, it's especially valuable if you had like a healthcare worker who was linked to transmission. But I would go after that and decolonize a person. Say you had a worker who you kind of trace it back and look like that was the source, you might then try to decolonize that person because it does work and it's much better than uh, bats and tracing. But if you try and use that same mupiracin on open wounds, it really doesn't work very well at all. It really works best just in the nose. Now, what about using it more frequently? Uh, they tried to do this in a VA uh, long-term care facility. Uh, MRSA positive patients received mupiracin ointment, and they rat rapidly eradicated MRSA within one week from the facility. But even when they tried to do weekly 
maintenance with mupiracin, 40% recurred and 11% became mupiracin resistant. Because these bacteria are going to beat us every time, right? The more you use it, the faster you lose it. So most people feel that you can't go after a facility or a work environment because it's just going to come back from external colonization and then you just can get resistance. Uh, at Montreal Hospital, they saw the empiricity resistance go from 2% to 8% to 62%. Uh, when they started to use it in all patients to try and get rid of MRSA. So basically, the more you use the or or Bactrapan, the less it's going to be effective. So you really need to be selective about when you would use it. So when would I consider MRSA decolonization? Uh, it really has not been proven, but what I would consider for people with a recurrence of an abscess despite adequate therapy, I've had people who have three, four, five severe infections who will decolonize those people. Uh, if you have ongoing transmission in a well-defined cohort like a family uh, unit, a sports team, and you could extend that to the work environment. If you had uh, multiple transmissions, then you might culture the, the workers in that group and consider decontamination. But like I said, I wouldn't do that on my own. I would get input from my local health department or VDH to get guidance on that once you've identified the connection.